Good evening. Uh, welcome to our last session for today. Um, I'm really happy that Henry Bergius has come to DrupalCon to give a talk about decoupling content management. What that means, you will uh, learn to understand in the next 45 minutes, and I leave everything else to him. Please, yep. Henry. Yeah. Hello. Does this work? Yes, perfect. OK. So I'm Henry Virgius. I work for a company called Nemain in Finland, though actually, by accident, I find myself living in Berlin. Uh, as a bit of a background, I've been doing content management for quite a while. So this is from my blog from 1998, where we, when we started Midgard as the, one of the very early open source CMSs out there. Um, but anyway, to the subject of the talk. So regardless of what you're using, in this, in this room it's pretty clear most of you are using Drupal. So I'm, I'm sad to tell you your CMS is a monolith. If you look at any content management system, this is pretty much the general architecture there. There's some database, maybe NoSQL, usually relational. There's the file system where you put your images and stuff. And then on top of that, there's just this one big blob called a content management system. Now, this obviously carries some problems. Uh, for instance, in Drupal, now you, you have people working on Spark, which is a very cool editing interface. And there might be people who say, yes, I would really like to use this. But then their IT department says, no, we, don't, we are not touching this PHP stuff. Or, of course, the other way around, the IT department says, OK, we want our strategy is to do everything in Java or .NET or whatever, but then the UI sucks. So really, by having everything bundled together, uh, you really limit the options quite a lot. So I was thinking, how could we move the state of CMS forward? How, how could we solve this problem? And I came up with this picture on the right, which kind of separates the CMS into three discrete blocks. So on the bottom, you have a content repository, which is uh, responsible for keeping the structure of your data, the storage, the retrieval, all, all of that. Then in the middle, you have a web framework that actually does most of the functionality of the website. And then finally, as a separate piece, you have an editing tool. This is very much following the kind of engineering principle of having a clean separation of concerns. So each part of your setup is responsible for some part of information, some part of functionality. But, and, and that is the only part dealing with this. So the web editing tool provides the tools for you know, adding images to text, doing formatting, all that stuff that users need to do when they publish content. The web framework actually provides the business logic. It provides the rendering of the web pages, the routing, all that stuff. And then the content repository keeps your content. It ensures that it's always correct. So it handles the validations and things, provides the retrieval APIs and so forth. And none of them really like uh, walk into the other's territory. Um, for the past couple of years, I've been working with this European Union funded project called IKS because obviously moving CMSCs to become decoupled is quite a lot of work. So I'm very happy to have uh, your tax euros at my disposal. Um, it has like, event, I published a blog post a, few, a year and a half ago about this and since then it's been kind, become a kind of a rallying cry for fixing the state of CMS. Uh, now, thanks to Lucas over there, we have a website for this message called decoupledcms.org, where the idea is to collect these different resources, lists of libraries you can use to make your CMS decoupled, and of course, also to promote the CMSs that are built in this way. So if you have any ideas for that, please contribute. Um, so how to actually move forward in practice. Like the idea of having these discrete different blocks is nice, but obviously you need to have those blocks. So the first of them is the editing interface. And there, 
instead of just saying we need an editing interface, I wanted to do something. And out of that came create.js. Uh, it's a web editing tool which can work with any CMS out there. But building a, building a web editing tool, you know, where do you start? Because as you know, as, as you have built Drupal, for instance, you know that there's quite a lot of work in building an editing interface. And so I thought, okay, to come up with an approach, we need a constraint, some sort of constraint for ourselves. So let's see if we can build a CMS without a single form. I mean, it's very, you know, unnecessary limitation. Obviously, forms are fine for various purposes, but this decision was made so that we could focus the effort into something. I mean, forms are wonderful when you're actually creating data. Like, you use forms to file your taxes, you use your forms when you're entering countries like Russia or USA, you know. But do you really want to use the same interface metaphor you use to communicating with the government to also communicate with your web audience? The modern web can do so much better. So here's one screenshot of Create in action. Uh, basically, what you have is your website as it is. All of your layout, all of your CSS is there because that's your web page. The only thing we add on top of it is this toolbar where you have the necessary functionalities like uh, the editing buttons, being able to save stuff, uh, publishing, unpublishing, whatever the CMS wants you to have. All of the editing, how many of you saw this Spark presentation? A few, okay. So all of this works in very similar way in that we are not doing anything crazy about your content. The content you're editing as you're writing it, it is actually the content on the page. So if you have some funky web fonts or whatever, all of the editing tools will be editing the stuff as it's shown. And yeah, Spark is using the Aloha editor. Uh, in Create, we have different editor options. One of them is Hello, an editor I wrote but you can also configure it to use Aloha instead. So in th this way, it's very flexible. If you want to use something else, let's say TinyMC, please don't, uh, you could configure Create to do that. Uh, the first kind of big question, like problem with the approach came when we were thinking, okay, so if we're not doing any forms, it's very easy to go and edit content that actually exists. But how about actually creating content? How could you do that without forms? And for that, we came up with the concept of collections. So let's say you have a list of articles or a navigation tree or something. You mark it up as a collection and you get this add button next to it. You click add and a new empty content item slides into view. Uh, what you see this title content created at there uh, We kind of borrowed that idea from let's say PowerPoint or uh, LibreOffice where when you create a new slide They mark the places where you can write stuff with these kinds of markers So you know okay now I have this new content item. I can just go and write the title write the content press save and Let's say Drupal would create a new node Another kind of difficult one was image handling. Again, how do you upload things without forms and so forth? Uh, luckily, with HTML5, we do have the tools. And this is where uh, the Swiss company Leap did great work by providing us with very nice drag and drop image tools. So first of all, we can do suggestions. So we figure out we look at the tags of your content and we can suggest images that have been used in similarly tagged content items. You get this dialog next to your, next to the content when you want to insert an image. You just choose an image or maybe search in your media repository or upload a new one. And then you just start dragging the image to the content area. And to make things very clear what's going to happen if you drop it, we always show this kind of ghosted 
image there showing, okay, if you were to drop the image right now, this is how much space it would take with your text. This is how the text would flow then. So you always know how your content will look like when you perform an operation. Uh, linking is another kind of difficult uh, subject. I like to use a lot of links because that's what web is made of. And sometimes it's very hard to figure out where to link what thing. So one, one thing where we decided to do some automation for the user was to uh, use named entity recognition uh, tools so that we actually parse the text you're editing. We find things that are mentioned like companies, people, products, whatever you have in your uh, so-called knowledge base and we suggest links to you. So this works very much like a spell checker. You write your text and wherever we recognize a potential link, a underline appears, you click it and we see, you see where the link would go and you can accept it or reject it. And if, if there are different potential things like the BBC radio here, could be any of the BBC radio stations, uh, then you get to choose. Or maybe you want to link to something completely different. But anyway, the idea here is to automate a lot of these uh, cumbersome processes that content editors have to do. So, like, not using forms was one, like showing the content as it really is on the page and not using forms but instead using the capabilities of modern web was very important for us. But another reason, like, I think in the Aloha presentation or the Spark presentation, uh, people were being polled about where the content actually starts its life in. And with any web CMS, the content is actually not written in the CMS. It's always written in Microsoft Word. And then copy pasted, producing terrible HTML that we as authors, uh, as uh, developers of editors have to clean up and, you know, everybody's in pain. Um, we were asking users, why are they doing this? Why are they using Microsoft Word for writing their web content instead of using the collaboration tools, the workflow tools, all the stuff that the CMS can provide? And there were two clear reasons. One of them was that traditional CMSs give you very little space for your content. If you look at, let's say, the current editing interface in Drupal 7, the actual body of the page you're editing is this tiny, tiny, tiny box in a big form looking like Microsoft Word 97 slapped into the middle of a web page. Sure, you can full screen it, but nobody actually remembers to do this. So people were feeling very constrained by these small spaces we give them. The approach taken by both Spark and Create is that because the content edited is the one shown on the page, you will have as much space as you need. And the other one was, how many of you have ever writing something to the web lost it? Your browser crashed, your session expired, the server crashed, whatever. Okay, about half of you. So the other half that either doesn't write anything or, or is in deep denial. <laughs> so what we decided was we will never lose your content. So what we do in Create is every character you press, every formatting change you do, all of that we store in your browser's local store. And if anything bad happens, whenever you come back to the page, you will get this nice friendly dialogue saying, okay, these and these of your content items have local modifications. Would you like to restore them? You click restore, your changes are back in the page as they were. So you can always safely go back whatever bad happens. Now there's a few CMSs that have gone this way. Uh, first of all, there's the Symfony CMF effort where the idea is to build kind of generic set of content management tools on top of the Symfony framework, correct? <laughs> uh, their reference user interface is based on Create. Now, if you look at this picture, it looks actually quite different from the previous screenshots, right? The reason for this is because 
just like Symfony, Create is actually just a set of widgets and a base library for building your own editing tools. We provide a default UX, a default way for Create to look like and behave like, but you can actually go and configure it in other ways. And this is something like Spark is awesome, and I hope this is something where we can eventually collaborate. Vim is smiling, so maybe that will happen. Uh, anyway, another one, again, looking quite different, but based on exactly the same code, is uh, OpenCMS. So this just is there to show that these tools are really backend independent. It doesn't matter whether your stuff is built in Symfony or Midgard or Drupal or Java, like OpenCMS. You can integrate these same content editing tools there. This screenshot is still running TinyMC. They are switching to Hello pretty soon. And then, of course, there's this CMS that some of you may have heard of. <laughs> so there is an effort to do an integration module for CreateJS in Drupal. Uh, and there's a couple of screenshots from it. It's still in pretty heavy development. So, But you can see, you can tag stuff. You can add images. All this normal stuff is sort of there. And if you're interested, it's available on Drupal.org. Ronnie, would you stand up? Here's the developer. So if you're interested in seeing where you can take this, talk to this guy over beer. He likes that. <laughs> yeah. So he's from Druid in Finland. Uh, they are doing pretty good work here. So how does this actually work? Uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, there is one set of APIs we use between the web framework, so in this case Drupal, and the editing tool, in this case CreateJS. So first of all, the web framework publishes web pages, surprisingly, annotated with some RDFA. That's what we use in Create. In Spark, they use some data attributes, but this is probably another area where we will try to work together. And then we edit stuff on the JavaScript side of things. And then we use RESTful JSON-LD calls to actually get the content back to the server. So how many of you know RDFA? Most, OK. So I'll walk through this quickly. Basically, the problem here is HTML itself, like you can understand what's being talked about here, but machine can't. And to be able to edit things, we need a way for our JavaScript code to agree with your Drupal code about how this content works, what's the content that you edit, and so forth. Otherwise, we couldn't save it back. So we had the annotations there. And then JavaScript can understand it. So for this, we use the VIE library, an MIT licensed uh, JavaScript library for dealing with RDFA, with JSON-LD, and so forth. Uh, here's a quick example. We parse the RDFA from the whole document. And then we get this book from the parsed set of entities. And you suddenly have normal attributes. So essentially, we are providing this MVC layer on the client side on top of the content that your CMS produces. And of course, you get bonuses like SEO. Uh, suddenly, Google can also understand your content if you want them to. Uh, JSON-LD is probably a bit uh, less known. How many of you? Very good. <laughs> so it's a way of serializing uh, graph-based data into JSON format. And the benefit here is there are many ways to serialize this kind of data, but JSON-LD is reasonably clean. Apart from the context, this would pretty much be the same JSON that you would write if you were defining your APIs by hand. So it's still readable, not scary, easy. Lynn is <laughs> laughing. Okay. Uh, the good, good part of the story for Drupal is that uh, JSON-LD is apparently going to be pretty well supported in the future. Uh, I don't know if the story has changed much since this was written. Well, the issues that were open have been closed since I posted that uh, 
Okay, so yes, Drupal 8 will have JSON LD. So, <laughs> fingers crossed. Okay, so Drupal is pretty much ready for this approach. You already have RDFA, there's some issues that need to be resolved, I'm being told, and then there's JSON LD, so you already have everything that you would need to run create. VIE is the base library there. This is especially the part that I would like to see in Spark, because that would give us a common client side API for managing the content. So it deals with the entities, it deals with the type information, it can read and write RDFA in your DOM, and it can talk to various semantic services out there like DBPDA or Stanball to enrich your content. And generally for PHP, there's various libraries for this. One, one that I've been talking about today quite a bit is Create PHP, which is uh, the PHP library that is meant to be used for integrate and create into various PHP-based systems. It's currently, it was originally made for Midgard, and it's also now being used in Symfony CMF. And I, I think I saw some commits from the Typo3 guys uh, where they were also adding this library to their integration. So that's an easy way to do this if you're doing PHP. Then there's the Drupal module already, which, as Ronnie said, contributions to which are very welcome. And then for Symfony, there's the Leap VIE bundle. Or is it already renamed? Okay, so yeah, eventually it will be called Leap Create Bundle. <laughs> then the other part of the story. So now we've pretty much solved how to extract the content editing tools from your CMS. Then the other part is how to extract the data storage out of your CMS so that then you can actually have this clean tree level architecture. So for this, there is the PHP CR effort. Uh, before I start talking about that, I would like to ask Lucas to stand up because he's the, let's say, father of this uh, effort. So PHP CR is a standard API for different CMSs to use to store and retrieve content. The original concepts and APIs come from the Java world, where there's been a standard for this since early 2000s, which most of these big enterprise CMSs, I think, already support. And now, as far as I understand, the PHP part is also being sort of incorporated into the standard. So, yeah, so in the next, next version of the JCR standard, there will also be the PHP definitions. So, this is not just a set of libraries that PHP people agreed upon by, by themselves, but instead it's actual a real written standard, which is good. So what is PHP CR? First of all, it's a collection of interfaces. And obviously, and more importantly, it's also a collection of, pretty big collection of unit tests. The reason for this is there are different implementations of PHP CR. Uh, you will be able to use the same, exact same PHP API to talk with various different ways of storing and managing content. So for instance, there is Jackalope, which can talk to the Apache Jackrabbit uh, server, which is the Java implementation of, the Java reference implementation of JCR. It, can, it also has a Doctrine DBAL implementation, which is a pure PHP implementation that can store to I think just relational databases or, so you can, with this you can keep your content in MySQL or SQLite or whatever without having to have any Java or extension or other dependencies. Then there's Midgard 2, which is the implementation I've been behind. So you can also store things in the Midgard content repository where the downside is that you will need a PHP extension and the upside is that the same content repository APIs, the same data, are available for various other languages like Python or JavaScript or Java, which helps if you need to integrate with external tools. There's probably a couple of other implementations at work, but these are the ones that I'm mostly aware of. <coughs> so yeah, the idea is you as a CMS developer, you write against this single API. Single API for storing, querying, searching content. And then when it's the time to deploy 
your software to a client, you can choose whichever PHP CR implementation you want to do, use. Maybe some, some client wants to keep their stuff in the file system, or some other wants to keep it in Oracle, or MySQL, or MongoDB, or whatever. You only have to choose this at deployment time, because all the APIs are exactly the same. Your code doesn't need to change, just the configuration. So what can, what can a content repository do, to, do for you? I mean, ORMs sort of already provide an API that can abstract different storage methods. Well, think of content repository as ORM or steroids. There's quite a lot of stuff there. First of all, the content is organized in a big tree. So you can traverse the tree, you can attach stuff into the different branches of the tree. This, this is very similar to how file system works or how most typical websites work. You can access data by their unique IDs. You have workspaces, which means storing, for instance, draft content for users becomes very simple. So you can give a user a workspace of their own. They can handle their content there, do their changes, and then you can move them to the main workspace when it's time to publish. Versioning, another very important thing for content management handled. Multi-valued properties. Person may have multiple email addresses or phone numbers or whatever supported. There are different query languages. So there's a query object model, which is a pretty typical query builder. You also have this SQL2 uh, language, which you can use to write uh, string-based queries. Uh, there's XPath, but I think that's actually dropped out of the spec now. Yeah. And then another very useful thing is there is a standard XML format for importing and exporting content. So you can always move from, like, if one of these content repository implementations that you deploy the site with doesn't scale enough or isn't reliable or whatever, you can always take your content out of it and switch to another one. Permissions are there. So you, again, stuff you don't need to care of. Capability discovery is important because some systems don't support all of the features of PHP CR, so you can always, in your code, check, is versioning supported? Is this and this su supported? And so forth. So the base idea here is doing simple stuff like retrieving an object from the database and showing it, or updating a property there and saving it. That's very easy. But then, if you need more, you need full text search, you need versioning, that's still possible with the same API. So this is essentially how it looks like. You take a repository, you log, to it, log into it. So this is a bit like providing your MySQL uh, username and password to connect to the database. You get the session out of that. Out of, with the session, you can access the different workspaces, and then you can access the nodes and their properties through the API. All of the content is stored in a tree of nodes. This may be somewhat familiar to Drupalers. Uh, the nodes have a name, they have a type, and then they have properties. The types can provide various kinds of constraints. They can say, okay, in this node you can have whatever, or they can say, okay, this node will have a first name and last name, which are strings. So this is the way you can actually define your content structure. And then they have, can have child nodes of various other types. So how does it actually work? Um, here's an example with Jackrabbit. Uh, when I was making these slides, the pure PHP implementation wasn't quite there yet, so uh, that's why I'm showing the one where the content is actually stored with this Java service. But, you know, the, the code is exactly the same. So first of all, you give the URL or the database details or whatever of your repository. Then you get the repository instance from this repository factory. You present your credentials, log in, and you get the session. After that, the whole PHP CR API is available for you. And that's really the only repository-specific part here, the different configurations you provide. So with Jackrabbit, you provide just this URL. With Midgard, you provide some other information, like where should be the file attachments stored, what's the database, and so forth. 
So once you have the session, you can actually start working with your content. So tree in PHPC are always have a root, has a root node. So that's where you usually start from. You get the root node. Then we can, in, in this case, we check if there is a subnode called example under the root. If not, then we create it. We set the property to it. Then we retrieve it, and we get the value. So it's it's pretty simple way of working with stuff. And there's always this session save. So you can do as many operations with your content as you want, and then save all of them together with this save method. So you can bundle up all kinds of database operations together. So yeah, a little bit about the node types. Uh, this is something you can define yourself. This is probably very familiar, again, to Drupal developers, because you have actually a pretty good way of defining different content types in your CMS. So yeah, nodes, dif node types define what kind of properties you can have, what kind of children they can have. There are some built-in types like file, which is kind of useful if you're, let's say, uploading images to your CMS. Uh, unstructured, which is essentially whatever. So it can has, have anything as properties and anything as children. And yeah, then you can define your own types. So you could say, OK, person has this and these properties. But the typical recommendation is before you go too far with defining your content types and stuff, just build your content with the unstructured type. You can always add the structure later. Because often when you're building a web application, you don't really exactly know what your data you're going to have in the end. So in PHPCR, you can actually do this. You can start by just saying, OK, I have this big bucket of unstructured information, just like you would do with uh, most of these NoSQL systems, like let's say CouchDB or I guess MongoDB. You just stuff data into your nodes. And then later on, when you know, OK, our articles are structured like this, you can go and say, OK, change the type of these nodes to that type. And then you get all these validations and other things. Querying, uh, here's an example of the SQL2 language. So get the, you get the query instance, you create the query, you execute it, and you get an iteratable list of nodes. Very simple. I guess if you've ever written SQL, it looks pretty, pretty familiar. And of course, the same you can do with the query builder to have a bit more object-oriented approach. Versioning, I mean, this is something that is traditionally very difficult for CMSs to have. But if you're using PHPCR, it's just there. So first of all, you check if the repository you're using supports versioning. Maybe in a CMS, you don't want to do this die thing. But you'll just skip this method or whatever. And then to a particular node, you add a mix-in called versionable. So after that, that particular piece of content can be versioned. When you have versioning enabled, you can change the properties of an object. And you can do these commits whenever you feel like. So maybe you are doing that automatically for the user. Or maybe you do that when they actually save something, or however you need to do this. But anyway, you just commit whenever you want to create a new version. And then you can walk through the list of versions and restore whatever you want. And this works with every type of content. This works with files. This works with uh, objects that have structured data, unstructured data. So you, you can even version the images that the user upload, if you want. And yeah, I was talking about the export and import. So again, you have a very simple way of saying, OK, export the content starting from this part of the tree as an XML file, dump it into the file system or serve it to the user, and then, again, you can import it back. And you can also do this to copy content within the same repository. So this can also be a nice thing to have in a CMS. It's, you know, the XML is pretty verbose, but the good thing is it's standard. So the same XML format, you can use it to migrate your data from Midgard to Jackrabbit to this pure PHP implementation to whatever PHPCR provider, or even just to a JCR system. 
So if, if you have a client that is actually using some of these big enterprise CMSs that support JCR, you can actually use this same interface for getting content out of the Java system and putting it into your CMS. So essentially, this is what the picture I would like to see when I come to DrupalCon a couple of years from now. <laughs> uh, I would like to see Drupal being a decoupled CMS. So there's the layer in between, which is actually Drupal, which provides all the smarts of a CMS. Underneath, there would be this standard repository API. And above, I mean, create is there just as, as an example. In, in an optimal situation, you would have multiple different editing interfaces you can choose from, just like you have different PHP CR providers you can choose from. Uh, I don't know if we are actually getting there, but I have to say Drupal is definitely moving, making the right kind of moves. The Symfony stuff happening in Drupal 8 is great, uh, as is the JSON-LD stuff. Uh, I think Spark is very promising for having uh, decoupled, or at least partially decoupled, editing layer. And Lucas told me earlier that there's been also some discussion in moving towards PHP CR, maybe in Drupal 9 or whatever. That's probably going to be a bit uh, of a longer road because that obviously means changes in how Drupal actually stores and retrieves content. And so, you know, decoupling gives you flexibility when you're building your stuff. It gives you flexibility when you're deploying, but it also means something new. It means collaboration between different CMS projects. So in this context, you've probably never seen these logos together on a slide. You know, we used to hate each other, right? Uh, now suddenly, all of these systems can utilize the same JavaScript tools, the same user interface widgets, the same storage logic, the same PHP libraries, thanks to things like Symfony and Composer. So we can finally share code. We can stop reinventing every wheel every time we build a CMS. And this means we can actually share resources because building an editing interface, as I'm sure the good people here are realizing, is quite a lot of work, especially as most CMS projects don't have that many JavaScript developers. But put together, these different CMSs do have enough people to get big, complex things built if needed. So most of these projects here do have at least some part of decoupling story already there. Maybe there's the user interface, maybe there's the PHP CR stuff, or maybe there's both in the best case. And that means we can finally share code with each other. And then, you know, Drupal can stay focused on the things that makes Drupal Drupal, and Typo 3 can do the same, Midgard can do the same. You know, we don't have to spend so much time on the drudgery on the low end. So before we go for questions, I would, we do have a surprise demo. <laughs> so uh, SCORE wanted to show some uh, stuff using some of our libraries and JSON-LD working in Drupal already right now. Uh, can we get the mic on? And the change of the display. Right. Is anybody awake there? So, Great. Henry asked me to uh, come on stage and present some uh, very early prototype of um, what I started to build, which is integration between VIE and Drupal. So what I want to show you is I'm starting from a, a Drupal 7 site, an empty site that has uh, just a couple of content types that you get by default in Drupal. And it also has uh, no content, so it's a purely empty site. And I have a VIE uh, form generator here loaded. And um, the way this works uh, is that it it pulls the schema from schema.org and it builds the form 
uh, on the fly based on the schema that it retrieves from Drupal, from schema.org. Here, we are going to add a restaurant to our Drupal site that is empty right now. So I've pre-filled some values here. I'm going to turn on Firebug to see what's going on behind the scenes. And I'm going to save. Oh, fingers crossed, you see um, the request, and there you go, saved. So now we're going to switch back to Drupal, turn off Firebug here, reload the list of common types. And here it tells us that it imported a template from schema.org, the restaurant template. It also has a new content type, restaurant, and it has all the fields from schema.org. And if I reload this content page, it also got the restaurant that I uh, imported with the values that I filled in. Um, so that's all done via RESTful web services. And um, I can also do the same. Another one here. Uh, save that. That was faster because the content type was already there. Uh, and if you look at the, if you look at the post, it's got. Um, it returns you the, the new resource that was created. So if you go here, now we had one restaurant, and now we should have two. There you go. Second one is here. So. The way this works is that um, we have VIE, as Henry uh, explained, that has um, uh, a, a DOM tree here with RDF in it, and it maintains a JSON-LD model client-side. And that's the, that's the data that we send to Drupal. So the JSON-LD is the data that's sent to Drupal um, via Ajax. And um, Drupal gets that, that JSON-LD document. Um, it transforms it to match the schema that it has locally, and it, it fills in uh, the you know it creates a new resource. And here, uh, as a side effect, you also have um, some RDFA for uh, for your for your imported content that you just created. Uh, that's just because we have the the schema information uh, all shared across syntaxes and RDFA and JSON LD, for example, here. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I wanted to show. Cool, thanks. Yeah, so I guess we do have some time for uh, questions. Yes. So who wants to go first? Yes, please. Okay, so the question was whether you can have multiple trees in PHP CR referencing each other. Uh, yeah, referencing different, the same nodes used in different trees, right? Yes, is the answer. Uh, you can have like one PHP CR workspace has one tree, but obviously you can have like organize this as subtrees if you want to use one workspace, and you can have references between nodes. So this is the way, for example, in Symfony CMF, uh, you can build, if you, you can have the navigation uh, and the routing and the content as one tree, if you want. That's the kind of simple setup. Or then you can also use the more flexible setup of having a separate tree for navigation, routing, and content, and they just reference each other. Anything else? Yes. Uh, by default, oh, so the question was, uh, what is the content like if you're editing a block of HTML, like the contents of an article, for instance, uh, what's the format of that being sent to the server? By default, it is HTML as we get it from the editor. So typically, these editors do some cleanups to that before it's sent. But you can actually plug in some other JavaScript code there. So for instance, we do have an example of create actually producing markdown. So this maybe shows you that there's quite a lot of flexibility there. 
yes. Yeah, so the question was validation. Um, there's obviously, you will, do, you will want to do validation on both sides of the equation. Uh, you cannot just trust that the JavaScript side of st stuff does the things correctly. So you also, you want to validate things on the server, but also to be more user friendly, you will want to do some validations on the client side, right? Uh, for this, uh, First of all, for like the big stuff, like the consistency of your content, like person having the right fields of right types and so forth, this is something that PHPCR does for you. Or then, you know, you do it in the way your CMS does it traditionally. Uh, you can also tell, create about these same constraints and then create in near future, we'll be able to do the same validations on the client side. And my plan is to enable you to also do per property validation callbacks in JavaScript. That's probably something I'll do uh, in two weeks when I meet the type of three people because they did have some concerns in this area. So that's, that's the plan. And I mean, some validations are easy, like it's very easy to check if something is an email field or whatever, for instance. Does this answer the question? Okay, thanks. Next, there. So to shorten the question, the question was whether the data model and the views that uh, create uses, whether they are available for uh, other backbone applications. The answer is yes. So the way VIE works is uh, every piece of content that you, or you see in create, for instance, is its own backbone model instance. Any relations between content times, uh, items are collections. And then the actual RDFA in the DOM is a view. And you can get access to all of these through the VIE instance. So if you're doing more backbone stuff on your website, you have access to all of that. Yeah, so uh, the question was how to do these templated pieces of content like standard, like let's say image with caption or YouTube video or whatever. Uh, the answer to that is that's pretty much something the editors handle for you. So uh, Aloha has the blocks feature. Hello has a little bit less functionality in that area. Uh, we were chatting about this with uh, Vim earlier and one thing that sort of makes it easier is that uh, with create, you have a way of easily refetching content from the server. So you could say, okay, now I want this article without the filters applied to it. So I want the raw contents with the tags as they are, so that then 